freely, willingly a prisoner of hope. <clears throat> Thank you for that. As I was getting out of my truck this morning, Mrs. Paravalaris told me she said that today is my husband John's birthday. John's been in heaven for many years now. <clears throat> and she said, and today his granddaughter, Ashley Schumann, was on the end, is singing the solo part. <laughs> That's precious to her. And she said, John's going to get a hear it in heaven. And so you never know what a day may bring forth, how God will put something together. John Perry Valeris was our, our uh, Greek here in the church, and he made that gyros and all of that, and, and uh, he was a, truly a man of God. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Colossians chapter 3. We'll read one verse this morning. Colossians chapter 3, and... Um, I want to remind you of, uh, now we're still in missions conference, you might say that I'm not preaching on missions today. Um, <clears throat> we've got to finish up some work. Uh, we need to raise at least $450,000. We didn't get there on Wednesday night, so some of you will turn these in today. And there should be a card laying uh, every other seat or somewhere close. And I want you to, if you've not already filled one out, this is your chance to do it today. At the end of this service, we'll take the offering plates around again and... Uh, uh, we'll tally these up again tonight to see what God has done. We may do it again next week and uh, see what God puts on top of it. But this is how we make our mission budget. It's all anonymous. So if you gave last year, you can't say, well, they know what I gave. Well, so we don't. And so if you'll just put the total amount that you're going to give, if you raise it, put it on there. And if God's been good to you this year, that would be great if you would raise it. Uh, we understand that the, the coronavirus and all the, the economy and the shutdowns and so forth has really hurt a lot of people's income. And so we were expecting just a little bit of downturn this year, but we trust that we can at least make back what we need to make back to take on the four missionaries we had this week and to be able to, uh, to do some work with the rest of our missionaries. So <clears throat> if you will feel that out now, the mission budget is, is very healthy and we want to keep it that way. So if you'll plan on doing that, we'll do it again tonight. We'll see what God will do. Colossians chapter number three, let's stand together, please. As we read God's word, Colossians chapter three, <clears throat> We're going to read one verse there. Verse number 15, I want you to read it out loud with me together. Verse 15, let's read that in unison together. Ready? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Would you say that last phrase with me together? Ready? And be ye thankful. Say it again, would you? That is a command. That's not a suggestion. And throughout the New Testament, you'll find that resounding theme of being a thankful Christian. We're living in a generation that's not thankful at all. We'll address that in just a moment. But I want to say that one of the best ways that we can be thankful is to look at the life of Jesus Christ. He's our perfect example for everything. So today I'm going to preach a very topical, practical message that actually has um, points that you can, it's kind of like a little list that you can write down in ways that Jesus was thankful and ways that we can be thankful. Let's pray together. Father, bless now, please, your word and challenge us, Lord, with the truth that we'll speak today and help us understand you command us to be thankful. We cannot be part of this age we're living in and drive us, Lord, to thankfulness this Thanksgiving season. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. <clears throat> I'll read a real little story <clears throat> that you'll find, don't turn there, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, just two verses. The preacher put this in the book of wisdom. Here's the story, verse number 14. <clears throat> there was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it, that is in that city, a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Now that's found in your Bible. And you may say when you read something like that or hear something like that, well, that's unfair. How could anybody do that? They should have made him the mayor of that city. They should have put him in charge of all the military of that city. But the Bible says they didn't remember him. Didn't even remember his name. May I say, folks, that you may go through life and not be remembered. It doesn't matter if people remember you. What matters is that you're a thankful person. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 2, that in this age of apostasy, one of the prevalent attitudes would be 
the attitude of unthankfulness. The people would just be unthankful. Or we're not seeing that now. I'm not seeing it as much because I'm not watching as much news. But I'm just going to tell you, people are unthankful. We actually have people out there that because of the coronavirus, excuse me, I've got some throat trouble today. I'll figure it out. Maybe just need a little bit of turkey and dressing. Amen. People are saying now because of the coronavirus, we shouldn't be meeting together anyway. And you can have it your way. And that may be true where there's some great outbreaks and all that. But they say now that Thanksgiving is just in the way, it's just a spot on the counter, just do away with Thanksgiving. We don't need that anymore. Please understand that Thanksgiving is placed on our calendar by our forefathers so we would never forget to be thankful that what we have here in America was given to us by God. Don't ever forget that. I was just thinking about this today. Aren't you glad? And we just see pictures of people. We're no uh, selfies back in the time of the pilgrims and no snapshot photos. They didn't even have a Polaroid. Y'all remember the old Polaroid where you waited and then tore that thing off? They didn't even have that. So we just get our idea about what that first meal was like because of paintings and so forth. But inside of every painting I, I have ever seen about Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving was that turkey. How many are glad that that turkey gave his life for that first Thanksgiving? Now, I know some of you eat ham and some of you eat all that, and we always argue every year about how you eat your... Uh, cranberry salad and some of you just take the lid off and pop it out of a can all that but but everybody's different but we're living in a time where folks are just not grateful ingratitude is killing our nation in a big way children not thankful for their parents students not thankful for their schools not thankful for their teachers uh property all over america is being defaced and statues torn down by people that are ungrateful for our history and by the way, I, I thank God for the rich, godly heritage of America. Amen. What's going on right now in America is they're trying to strip us of all of that so that there would come a generation that would not remember. By the way, that's what happened in the book of Judges. You take all these things away where it's never taught anymore in schools and where kids can't ask their parents, how come that guy's sitting there on a horse with a sword on his side? The, the parent then tells the story. All that will be gone someday if something doesn't happen in America and our heritage will be all gone. You see, why would somebody do that? Because they're not thankful. Not thankful. I thought about how uh, daily we read about parents not thankful for their children. We'll see in the news every now and then. And every now and then on the evening news, there'll be some parent that abused some child. When my wife sees that, she turn, turns the channel immediately. She said, I can't, I can't stand to see that. You see, it's unnatural for a parent to abuse a child, but yet we see that more and more in America. We read of churches that have lost their thanks in their community with municipalities now slapping laws on them, which prevent them from having worship services and even spreading the gospel. And and, uh, I want to stop and say this right here. We live in a bubble at Franklin Road Baptist Church. We are getting to do what much of America is not allowed to do or they have been hindered from doing and understand that more and more right now there are municipalities putting strict guidelines on churches not to even meet i I just i've I've thought many times what would it take to get some of the good old-fashioned godly christians out of our church we just experienced it the past eight months and i'm just here to tell you that folks uh are, are not thankful for their churches when they do that because I believe our church and churches like our church is really what helps our city to live in peace. And there's a reason why cities in the South, and I don't mean to sound unkind, I'm glad I live in the South, and this is not true in every city, but there's a reason why cities in the South are as peaceful as they are compared to cities in the Northeast and cities in the, in the, mid, north, or the north and cities in the, on the West Coast. Because of the churches that are there that help keep the light on, the light of the gospel in those cities. And I'm just here to tell you that we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're unthankful. The very thing that keeps a town cleaned up. I think about the husbands not thankful for their wives. Wives not thankful for their husbands. Don't wait till it's too late before you're thankful for them. I think about employees not thankful for their jobs. And politicians not thankful for their voters. While we even had a A man this past year that said, I don't need your vote. I just need you to support me after you get in office. What in the world? I mean, uh, I remember where where politicians were thankful for their voters and they they would tell them that often. Sometimes write them a note or whatever. Uh, I want want us to consider 
the unthankfulness of our generation. I want to talk about the thankful Christ. If you and I can learn how to do anything by the example of Jesus Christ, <coughs> we can learn how to be thankful. I want you to write down seven things. Now, don't get uh, uneasy about being here for a long time. We got out. What held us over the last uh, service was we did the, the uh, faith promise cards. But I'm going to give you these pretty quick. I'm going to read the scripture. You might want to jot down the address. But I want you to consider how Christ was thankful. These are literal. I don't think we're taking any of them out of context. And how many believe that Christ would command us to be thankful that he would be thankful? Now, understand we're talking about the God-man. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, and he never failed in any of those roles. He couldn't fail. He was perfect. And so we're not perfect. So what I'm telling you is God giving us the example, Jesus Christ giving us the example of how we can be thankful. Once you jot these down, I'm going to give them to you a list. Here we go. Number one, write this down. First of all, Jesus was thankful for food. Jesus was thankful for food. In Mark 6, 41, the Bible says, And when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves. What's it mean when he blessed? It means he gave thanks for it. And he gave them to his disciples and set them before them. Now, we understand the context of that particular uh, meal. But Jesus Christ would often uh, lift his food up and ask the blessing on it and give thanks for it. Now, this may sound trite to you. But I'm just going to put the cookies down where everybody can get them, all right? I'm going to tell you why I ask the blessing on my meal every time we eat and every time we eat out is because I had an old-fashioned mom and dad that taught us that before we ever put a, a piece of food in our mouth, we're to give God, return thanks to God. I was taught that. How many times do you go in restaurants and you never bow your head and ask God to bless that food? You say, preacher, come on, you get off that. People just don't do that anymore. I know it. That's why we're losing our nation. That's why we're losing our families. That's why we're losing things that are near and dear to us because people have stopped giving thanks to God for something as simple as food. Is there anybody out there? You hear me right now. You ought to be teaching this to your kids and to your grandkids. Some of you need to come out on this thing. It used to be when I moved to the South that a lot of folks, you go in a restaurant, you see a lot of folks asking, asking the prayer for their food. You hardly ever see it now. May God help us. Jesus was thankful for his food. Write this number, number two. I said, well, I'll be thankful for Thanksgiving. I'm not talking about just Thanksgiving. I'm talking about all the time. Number two, Jesus was thankful for personal gifts. For personal gifts. Now, when I say that, Jesus was not able to, he didn't have a house. The foxes have holes. The birds have nests. Son of man hath not where to lay his head. He didn't know what a closet was or utility room or any place to attic, any place to store anything. He, didn't have, he had no use for that. And I, but I thought about this time when the, the lady with the, alab with the alabaster box came along, and she said, to, by the way, I don't, I don't have coronavirus, okay? I just got tested again the other day. I'm all right. Are you all in the front row? <clears throat> I mean, all God's children get to test all the time, test 18, 20 times, and run that thing up. <clears throat> And so uh, he was thankful for personal gifts. You know the story about the alabaster box. The alabaster box in, in itself was very expensive. Inside that alabaster box was an ointment of spikenard, very precious. In fact, one section says worth 300 penny worth. And, and I have no clue what that was and what that would be in our day. But even the old commentators have said it was $50. And some of those guys was reading, read, writing 100 years ago. So could you imagine several hundred dollars in that box, that little, we would call it like a ceramic type thing. It wasn't ceramic, it was alabaster. And she took that and broke it and poured it on his head and went down to his feet. Other passages that said she wiped uh, his feet with her hair. Verse 14, or chapter 14 of Mark, verse 6 says, And Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have, ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever... Ye will, ye may do good to them, but me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body for burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of, her, of, of for her for a memorial. The little phrase there, she hath done what she could. That idea carries with the thought that she was showing her thanks she was doing more than giving him a gift. 
She was outwardly worshiping her, the, worshiping Jesus Christ the best way that she knew how. And ladies and gentlemen, understand that folks will bring gifts to you from time to time. We should be thankful for those things. It doesn't mean that you always get a thank you note for that. Let me just say, if you give something with expect, expectation of getting something in return, be it a thank you note or somebody giving you a gift for what you gave them, it's just kind of like those two chipmunks on the cartoons when I was a kid growing up, Chip and Dale. Uh, they get on that say, no, 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 you go first. No, 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 you go first. No, no, you go first. You go first. Where's it stop? Thank you. Thank you for the thank you. Here's a text of thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I look, I'm all for that. But why do you legitimately give something? You give it as a gift. And so Jesus, I didn't see Jesus going around and giving a lot of personal gifts. In fact, he would feed the disciples from time to time. I believe that. He helped them with their taxes one time. He didn't have the money to do it. He reached down and got a fish and got money out of the fish's mouth and helped them pay their taxes. But I'm just saying that economy did not work like that back then. It should not work like that now. However, I'm not negating the point that we should be thankful for personal gifts. Number, number three, Jesus was thankful for friends. He was thankful for friends. Now listen to this. He says to his disciples, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. What's he saying? He's saying to these people that walk with him, you're more than my servants. You're my friends. You're so much my friends that I'm going to tell you what I know about the Father. And by the way, how many thank God that those disciples that later became apostles learned about God from Jesus Christ? And so uh, Jesus was thankful for his friends. How many of you are thankful for friends? Friends sometimes can be fickle, and sometimes you'll have somebody you think is a friend that will separate you from chief friends. Nevertheless, we go on. Jesus says, or the Bible says, I think the proverb is speaking of Jesus prophetically. It says, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And so we're grateful for friends. Now, because I'm a pastor, you may say, well, preacher, you've got a lot of friends and, of course, we have a lot of people part of our church. And I wish I could get every, every one of you a gift for Christmas. I wish I could send every one of you something special. Of course, you know that would be impossible for me to do. And God never planned it that way. So the best that I can as your pastor, you have to forgive me, the best that I can do is give you of my time in study, to give my time in prayer, praying for you and for your families, my concern for your problems, and try the best way I know how to carry your load. And help you when you allow me to help you with your heartaches. I give you my dreams <clears throat> that um, come from the night watch in my life. Many nights I don't sleep. Many nights God's pouring it in me. I give you my daydreams for this place. When I came here 21 years ago, I had plans that I, I believe that were from God. There's been a lot of things try to interfere with that. But I tried to keep my head down. I tried to keep going, not for you. Someday I'll die and move on. Someday I'll retire and, and go to Florida and play shuffleboard, I reckon. I don't know what I'll do. I may not retire. I may just stay here until I drool and you have to take me out of the pulpit. But I'll tell you, I, I'm a drooling now sometimes, so we might be close. <laughs> but the only thing I can do is, is give you as much as I can in my life and let you know that I love you and I'm thankful for you. I don't think God ever intended for the pastor to go around and be Robin Hood and give presents to everybody. I've never held another job. I've never had anything on the side. I've never loaned money with interest. I've never done anything like that. When I decided I was called of God, I decided I would live at the temple just like the Bible told me to. And God's taken very, very well care of us. But understand my joy and what I enjoy is whenever I get a chance to see you flourish and grow in the Lord. And so Jesus was thankful for his friends. I count you as my friends. Oh, I should say this right here, that a shepherd, a pastor is a shepherd, and a shepherd never enjoys losing not one sheep. Some may say, boy, I bet preacher, I bet you're glad they're gone. I've never felt that. In fact, I grieve over that. Number four, write this down. I said I'd give you seven things. Jesus was thankful for helpful service. He was thankful for helpful service. 
Matthew 25, verse 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them, On his right hand come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat, and I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Now, he's using his name as a personal pronoun, I, I. We all know Jesus was never in prison. We know that as far as, as, far as we know, he was never necessarily hungered unless he was fasting. And so the disciples were listening. They said, well, when were you ever, hun- when were you ever hungry? And he said, if you've done it, the least of these, you've done it, you have done it unto me. And what he's saying is this. He's saying, you need to be thankful for helpful service as I was thankful for helpful service. And as people helped you along the way, you need to be grateful for that. For every form of helpful service along the way. That's what heaven's all about. That's where our, what our rewards are all about. We don't uh, count our rewards here. We do things for other people, no strings attached. At least that's the ethical book that I read whenever I was growing up. Today, people seem like they want something for for what happened. That's foreign to me. I don't understand that. Nevertheless, we should be thankful for help. Number five, Jesus was thankful for revealed truth. That's the Bible. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, at, the time, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. When was the last time you thanked God for your Bible? You understand this is revealed truth? It's strange how that is written. He said he thanked the Lord that he'd revealed truth to him. He didn't reveal it to the wise. He revealed it to the babes. Wise people that's worldly wise seem like they don't need to get anything from God. They've got it all figured out. They think this is the way it should be. But God doesn't reveal truth to them. He reveals truth to babes. And so, uh, in other words, those that are younger in the Lord, you might say. Those that are not arrogant, you might say. I, uh, I know what you're thinking. You said, preacher, come on now. I'm thankful for my Bible. Is that right? When's the last time you read it? When's the last time you devoured it? When's the last time you came up out of it with tears in your eyes because of what God taught you in the scriptures? When was the last time that you took your life and made your life as best way you know how to match what the word of God says and live in your life? That's thanking God for his word. The next one's the last one's going to kind of take you sideways. Jesus was thankful for Calvary's suffering. Listen to this. Matthew 26, 27, and he took the cup, speaking of his blood, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. He gave thanks. I was, I don't typically do this, but I was kind of going over my notes with my wife and, and I gave her that last one, how Jesus was thankful for Calvary and big tears swelled up in her eyes. She said, how could he... How could you be thankful for the cross? She says, the way Christians treat Jesus. How can he be thankful for the cross the way the unsaved and the worldly and the wicked treat the Lord Jesus Christ? How could he do that? I'll tell you how he did it. You you see, the average Christian just don't get it. You don't know how much Jesus Christ loves us. Hebrews says that you and I, the church, or the people who be saved, were the joy that was set before him. Jesus looked past all of his suffering and all of his shame as he bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. He willingly suffered, fled, and died. He said, I laid me down my life. No man taketh it from me. That's not the talk of somebody who dreaded the cross, although there's a certain part of him whenever the sky started to turn dark and things got really, really bad. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And to answer that question for just a brief moment, Christ was rejected because God saw our sins on him. How could he? Hold that cup in his hand when he knew what was coming down and say, Lord, I thank you for this cup. You see, preacher, why do you even bring that up? There's two reasons. 
Number one, when was the last time you were thankful for your salvation? When's the last time you just stopped in your tracks and just got down and said, Dear God, thank you for allowing the gospel to get to America, allowing my family and me to be a a born-again Christian? There's a lot of places in this world that's never heard the gospel for the first time. You could, live, you could have been born in another country. He said, well, that's all the sovereignty of God. Well, how many you thank God that you were born in America and you heard the gospel? Apart from the sovereignty. I never try to figure out the sovereignty of God. That's the God, part of God. That's what makes God, God. But I'm glad I heard as a little boy in Evans, West Virginia, and I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. And sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and can God... I was born into a home of a mom and dad that loved Jesus. Got all their little boys to Christ. Thank God we raised our son and he married a godly girl. And now Braxton's saved. Baylor's, she'll burn down a few more buildings before she gets saved. But all because the grace of God we're entering the Thanksgiving we're going to thank God for all the turkey and whatever's around that table if, you, if you're able to meet together and fumigate the place and everybody wear hazmat outfits but when was the last time you said Lord thank you for suffering Taking my beating on the cross. The second reason I say this is because of the culture we live in. As we've already said in recent days that in this book right here, Christianity, Christianity never knew a peaceful time. All they ever knew was persecution. And somehow we've convinced ourselves that we're going to escape all of that. Maybe our generation will. I'm older. I don't know. But if you're paying any attention to the news right now, it doesn't look too good for the home team. Preachers right now are talking in certain states that they may have to exercise civil disobedience just to get their churches open. And I know what some of you are thinking. I've already heard, oh, well, they'll take that to court. They'll win. Well, they're not winning right now. Oh, well, they'll take it all, all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, if they have money. The time the average citizen takes something all the way to Supreme Court, they're so broke. Oh, that's what they have GoFundMe for. Ladies and gentlemen, it shouldn't be like that. But the second reason I bring this up that Jesus was thankful for Calvary's suffering, are you going to be thankful if you have to suffer for the cause of Christ? By the time I get to this stage and the second time I preach, I don't know if I've said this already or if I said it in the first service, so I'll just say it again. When I'm talking about suffering, I'm not talking about the toilet paper aisle at Walmart being empty. I'm not talking about the fact that you may not be able to get your favorite coffee. I'm talking about the fact that your church is closed and you don't know when it's going to open up again. And your Christian school is closed. And your job has went by the wayside. We like to think that everything's just going to be hunky-dory and everything's going to stay in place. What if it doesn't? What if you're called upon to suffer? The calls of Christ. Could you be thankful for that? Paul said, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Paul and Silas sat there in jail as our preacher brought out in one of his first services of messages this past week in the missions conference and talked about how they would sit there chained and they rejoiced and sang songs. They'd beat and thump around on them and bust them up and they'd come out of there laughing, rejoicing and go to the next, next to church service. You going to be like that? Being thankful. The thankful Christ. How in the world can we learn to be thankful like we should be in the Bible? Follow the example of Christ. Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. I appreciate your attention this morning. I want to ask you this question if I could. I wonder who would say this.
Pastor Norris, I just need to be more thankful. Would you lift your hand up? Hold up your eyes of testimony. I just need to be more thankful. Folks, let's be thankful for our Bibles. Let's be thankful for answered prayer. Just this past week, my wife and I received some very pointed answer to prayer. And I don't know what you do, but the moment my wife brings that to my attention, we immediately pray and thank God for it. I'm not trying to indicate that God's going to answer more of your prayers if you'd be more thankful. I am telling you that we should, because we love Christ, be thankful and tell him when he answers prayer. Father, thank you so much for the testament of your dear son. Thank you, Lord, that he showed us how to be thankful. And though food was the first part of, of the message, that's just a starting place. Teach us as we enter into this Thanksgiving season. Be thankful for our children, for our families, for our coworkers, for the fact that we have a job but most of all, may we be thankful for you and all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Your heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. They'll play softly right here. So while they play, let me just ask you this question. Maybe you just want to come and tell the Lord today you're thankful. And maybe today that you're not sure that heaven's your home. You're in the best place you can be to come to the Lord. We'll have somebody standing on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'd love to take that Bible this morning and show you how you could be a born-again Christian. Would you come today? If you've been saved, not been baptized, they'll help you with that. They'll talk you through becoming a member of this church. You just come. We'll sing, but I want you to consider a heart of thankfulness. Father, bless as we sing in this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just 